Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and this is Cutting Through the Matrix on August 30th, 2012. For newcomers, I always suggest you make good use of the website CuttingThroughTheMatrix.com and hopefully you'll start to understand the big system you're born into and how it's managed. Everything is managed on a micro level, in fact. Uh, that's culture, everything, industry, uh, even, the, even the crashes are managed way in advance and planned because they have purposes to fulfill, you see, and you're going through the purposes today. Um, even in the European Union, they're using the crashes there to amalgamate even further every country and to lose even more of its sovereignty. That's all part of the big plan. That's how it works. And, of course, it's presented to the public as just another crisis. And, my God, what can we do? Give up and put it into the hands of experts who come forward and tell you've got to go global. And it's a very simple technique. Now, help yourself, as I say, to the website. There's over a 1,000 audios here for download for free. And remember, too, all the sites listed on the com site have transcripts as well in English for print up, but you can also go into Alan Watt Sentinel EU and get transcripts for print up in other languages. Remember, too, you, the, you're the audience that bring me to you. You can help me keep going by buying the books and discs at cutting through the com. And you can also donate. And from the US to Canada, remember, you can still use personal checks or international postal money orders from the post office. You can use send cash or use PayPal. And across the world, Western Union MoneyGram and PayPal once again. And donations, as I say, are really, really welcome in these so-called austere times, part of the, the plan system as well that we're going through. And what I do is try the big organizations that uh, have run the world for a long time. They've changed their names over centuries, in fact, but they certainly run the money's world supply, and everything from there it controls everything else. You control the, money's, uh, the money supply of the world, and you lend to nations, a few people lend to nations, then literally everything else is secondary. Politics must bug down, down to you as they come cap in hand every year to borrow more cash. And you can also help make policy that way as well, and direct the policy of nations, including wars too. And it's true enough, the big boys at the top have tried out different experiments, they call them in history. Uh, the, the U.S. Revolution, the American Revolution, was an experiment, they called it the Great Experiment. And then they tried the Soviet system, which was its antithesis, and that was also called the Second Great Experiment. And because the bankers, you see, want a future where they have a controlled society, even controlled consumers like yourselves you are actually controlled, whether you like it or not. And they plan it this way. So when you look at left and right policies, it's no surprise that they merge together because they want a standardized, controlled society with themselves, as always, at the top, because they've managed the money of the system of the world for many centuries. It's not surprising at all. They're the best economists because they run money systems. These are the guys who plan wars and, and even decide how much um, the loser is going to pay and how they'll pay it off as well and have international agreements to do with all of that as well. So we land, we live through a really very different world and reality from the one uh, that uh, actually runs it, believe you me. It's vastly, vastly different. And we'll touch upon that tonight because I looked through the news today and the news is so rubbishy. It's, it's nonsense. It's nonsense news we're given. I mean, this is dished out by the same boys. Remember, the Royal Institute of International Affairs, CFR. These guys run the media of the world. And they dish it out by the bucket loads. So we can say, ooh, ah. And then they give you some trivia to say, oh my, look at that. Wow. The bearded lady. Back with more after this break. Hi folks, I'm back, cutting through the matrix, and as I mentioned already, uh, the news really is handed out by the bucket load for us all to goggle at or Google at, and uh, and really it's not meant to make much sense to you, it's meant to get reactions to you, emotional reactions, and also to advertise, because you're always the consumer in a, a media age, basically, electronic especially. Marshall McLuhan talked a lot about this too. Because he said that, that, um, that the very type of science that's used 
the electronic media would shape everything else around it. It would draw it in like a black hole, and um, you would find that um, you'd, you'd adapt to it and become it in a sense. So everything goes that way. It's kind of like when you, you get revolutionary music starting out to complain about things. And when it becomes mainstream, it doesn't have the punch anymore. It's used in ads and everything else. We saw that with punk rock and rap music and so on. It starts off with a lot of complaining and yelling and eventually becomes mainstream. And all things become mainstream because everything adapts eventually into a monetary system for profit. And I've gone through before some of the history of money and commerce especially, and those that have managed money and commerce for centuries, who've always looked towards the future for their own survival, which is paramount to the the whole philosophy. So naturally, they they try and always predict the future, but better than predicting the future is best to control the future, and they came to that conclusion a long time ago. A long time ago. So, And they also noticed, too, because they studied humanity, and they studied uh, and, and saw that we do adapt into science. I've, I've read the book before, The Impact of Science on Society by Bertrand Russell, for an, for an example. That's one of many books that go through this on the sociological impacts of how science itself will change you, the way you see the world, how you interact with the world, and what you think about and what th- things you like, dislike. It's all given through science as you adapt into it. And then you go into, again, back to the, the money boys who've been at us for a long time, and all of the associations and organizations they set up really in the late 1800s that became more, more public, and then into the 1900s, even more and more public, as they set up schools, spe- special schools or universities for themselves to recruit their own kind. They would see things in a much more complex way than had been taught before to do with social dynamics etc like the Frankfurt School and how they can actually by studying all of society and the culture industry and things like that how they could use all the techniques themselves to create the culture that they wanted and it didn't fade away by the way the Frankfurt School didn't fade away they simply morphed into something new especially when they start to get criticism when people, a few people generally to start with catch on to what they're really all about and so they morph into something else always with a nice sounding term by the way to throw you off what they're really up to but they also groom people often from childhood by the way they groom future leaders we see, you see that with common purpose organization in Britain who deliberately choose school children and they'll groom the certain ones that have the right abilities for the purpose for an, an even deeper integrated Europe a controlled society and, um, and, and these ones are, are let loose in the future and eventually you'll be voting for them when, when you're presented with them and you won't know about their past or anything else but not only them, people like Jack Atali, for instance, and I've mentioned him before as well, is a big player. I mean, he was given top positions in the French government at the age of 27, for instance. And obviously he'd been well, well groomed and trained for his particular role. He has things in common with the Frankfurt School, a lot in common, in fact, and you'll generally find it that way. He also has a lot in common with the old mercantile class because he always brings the, 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 the system of the past into the future that he predicts. He predicts it because he's part of a global system, and they sit in the biggest think tanks in the world and help steer the, steer the world into the direction they want it to go. But when he puts out writings, it's a good idea to study them because you, you'll get a lot of interesting information coming out of them. Some of it is futuristic and it's not far-fetched at all. Some of it's already here in, in its early phases. But he talks about them with enthusiasm because, after all, as I say, he's been groomed from childhood for this particular position. And he's got a big say in the United Nations and in the fears of France itself. And this is an article for an ex- example that he turns out. And he says, for a very long time we've known the day would come when genomics would keep its promises. This required that computing technology advances were able to release the computing power needed to reduce drastically the cost of the genome sequencing in plants, animals and humans. And lessons to be learned from the first cloning experiments of a living being and the introduction of genes from one species to another. It says, the day has arrived and the most insane exploits, the dreams and the nightmares, are now achievable. 
Thus, a team of researchers from Argentina, who'd already managed to clone a cow capable of producing insulin, has introduced simultaneously two human genes in the genome of a mammal cow who uh, received two human genes controlling the production of maternal milk in women. They will allow this cow's milk to contain lactoferrin and lysosin, Sim is called two proteins very abundant in human milk and almost absent in cows, improving the assimilation of iron, the production of red blood cells, the development of teeth and some intestinal cells in children who will consume them. More importantly, the calves from this cow will have one chance in three to have the same modified genes. This is a priori. This means that to, to make a great progress, we, we can criticize a technique that will improve children's health by improving the quality of milk they consume, or can we criticize it, he says. Because always use this is for the betterment and for health and all that. That's the technique is always used. Yet many questions arise, will the milk of such cows be considered safe? Is a cow that's cloned and genetically modified still a cow? Or is she the beginning of a new species? Does she have a human dimension? Finally, when consuming her meat, be cannibalistic. These questions are the most important, that this innovation, apparently minor, part of a set of much larger mutations, which allows already, and will allow even more tomorrow, the insertion of human genes into animals, and in working on stem cells to make animal organs compatible with humans, in order to have them transplanted. Further still, we will create new species, chimeras, capable of operating in difficult environments, radioactive, for example, or replace men in battle, and even supreme transgression to equip animals with a brain similar to the human brain. A little later in the meeting of computing, computing science, genomics, and nanotechnology, and neurosciences will allow man to create other species, ultra-human, superhuman. He's all for this, you see, because he's been trained his whole life for it. This is a very old, old goal, you know, amongst a certain uh, uh, clique. Let us not hope to put a stop to it unless some unlikely uh, world police makes a shrine of the, the human genome, as it is already. A place will always be found to conduct these experiments, inexpensive, justifying them by the promise of curing rare diseases or extending human life expectancy. And even if the West resists, the emerging countries from Argentina to China via Brazil and tomorrow Nigeria and Indonesia will welcome the desperate researchers after getting rid of God. Man will have gotten rid of himself. As I say, that's a very old, old goal, actually, for those who play God and who actually believe, uh, if you really understand what God means, they believe that they are gods. And Jack Satali is one of these characters, that uh, one of the few, actually, that come out into the public realm and take public positions, high positions. One of the few who actually do this, but he does give you the future, and he's written lots and lots of books about the future, your future, and how you'll even react as you go through the changes. How does he know this? Well, you see, he gets access to thousands of think tanks, informations and studies on all of us. He also has access to archives that people can't get into, of the histories of humans in the past. Real archives, big archives, and also real archives of real history, not the rubbish that they turn out for us to follow. You understand that reality is always bent for us to accept according to the system we're presently in or where they want to take you by those who already own the world via money, cash, commerce, and everything else. There's no such thing as, as, as giving an honest reality to the general public. It doesn't exist, never will exist, actually. Uh, but he's all for this uh, chimeras and uh, all kinds of um, trans, not just transhumanism, but uh, chimeras of animals and, and humans all mixed together for special purposes. An old idea goes back to, as I say, Plato, who talked about it in the Republic, breeding people for specific purposes and tasks. And science has been into this kind of goal for a long time. Science doesn't, doesn't go willy nilly across the board. And all oh, let's see what this all do. Let's see that. You only do as a scientist what your grant giver tells you to do. Because the boys at the top and the big foundations, especially that are fronts for the international bankers, by the way, um, they're the ones who dish out the big grants and tell them what they want. They don't say, here, take all this cash and see what you come up with in any field at all. They tell them, we want to know about this field. We'll put all this cash into it. Now it's all your job to find out how all this works and what we can do with it. So science is guided. 
as the whole point of science is guided into a system. And number one is always military, because those who own the commercial systems of the world also own the militaries, and they always have used militaries and needed militaries for their type of domination right up to the present time. And into the future, by the way, because a tally does go on into the future as to where it's all supposed to go. And you will react to it all. And some of, some of you are already reacting because you're awake to something being strange and odd about the rapidity of change and the direction of change and how all media seems to be on board with the same changes at the same time, even sometimes pushing the fun aspect of it all. Uh, and even the most awful things you read in some rotten newspapers, you know, the tabloid types, are presented in a funny way. You see, it's all a trivia way and ha-ha. And that's a standard technique as well, to throw you off balance. The average person is thrown off balance when you're looking at reading something serious and it's put in a, a trivial kind of ha-ha way. Uh, but the idea sticks in your head for predictive programming. Back with more after this break. Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt and we're cutting through the matrix talking about the system that people take for granted because it's simply here all around us, it's all pervasive and you think it's all quite natural. Never it dawns on you that what I'm talking about here, about the future, is, is really done by the same guys who gave you the present and, and everything you take for granted in the present, including the cultural changes that most have adapted to. This with themselves you understand at the top. Because he actually mentions in some of his books that there are world masters, by the way, for those who don't know that. And he's also written, as I said, quite a few books, 50 actually all all together. And this article here is is, is from A Brief History of the Future. And as I say, he sits in all the top think tanks, the ones who plan the future and the wars and the the crashes. He even has on his own website uh, that the European, what I've said for years, that all this crashing in the European Union countries uh, will give more power to the the European Central Bank, the private bank that was put in to take care of it all. And, um, of course, he said, too, that the the crisis will make them amalgamate more and more and give up sovereignty, which is the whole, he thinks it's all so wonderful. But anyway... In the book, Brief History of the Future, he talks about uh, the object as substitute for the state, from hyper-surveillance to self-surveillance. Now, it's also called self-policing, by the way, for those who, who've also read um, a lot of books in sociology. But he says, the markets will progressively find new sources of profitability and activities that are today exercised by the public services, and, such as education, health, environment, and sovereignty. Private enterprises will seek first to commercialize these services, then replace them with mass-produced consumer objects, dovetailing perfectly with the dynamic of technical progress at work since the beginning of the mercantile order. Uh, First, it will seek and find new means of accumulating more and more energy and information in increasingly reduced spaces. And it goes on to all the wonders that will come to do with uh, privatizing water and everything else and so on. Things are already happening across the world, so there's no big deal in what he's, he's disclosing there. But he says, these technologies will radically transform the way in which current objects are produced. It will allow the consumption of much, much less energy per unit produced, better management of drinking water, urban wastes, and polluting emissions. They will improve the characteristic of food products, clothing, housing, vehicles. I always tell you, he's like a salesman, too, for it, because, remember, too, he comes from the mercantile order from a very old family. Other nomadic objects, such as lenses, glasses, and prosthesis of different kinds, will miniaturize the means of information, entertainment, communication, and transport, leading to a massive rise in nomadic ubiquity. The single nomadic object will be integrated one way or another into the body. It will serve as a sensor and a controller, and a controller, right? This is adapted plastic materials, reusable and recyclable, will allow the transformation of clothing and um, into linked nomadic objects. That's already happening with the, with the micro sensors and so on. 
Other plastic materials will become throwaway screens, allowing for the creation of wall pictures in public places, uh, and so on and so on. This will turn our way of lighting, uh, building, reading, and living on its head. Personalized robots will help the sick and then the healthy in their daily lives. It's interesting because, again, he's pushing all the positive things that they always push when there's really a nasty thing hiding behind it because he goes in later on in the book to talk about the fact that insurance companies will end up running the world and they will alter your behavior and your, the way you, you, you look at health and your, your, how you consume food and everything else and even penalize you as well if you don't go along with their standardization. Because corporations always standardize everything, you see, including you. So he says self-steering cars and all the rest of it are coming in. And he says around 2040, the essential, the essential will begin. This is the essential. It will cut massively into the cost of organizing market democracies, reestablishing the profitability of industry, gradually reducing the role of states to zero. That's countries. And destroying little by little the polycentric order. Acting as the engines of growth, new objects will take over from automobiles, washing machines, and nomadic objects. These will be surveillance objects, replacing many traditional, uh, traditionally state-run functions, and I shall call them the watchers. Interesting, they've got masters of the world, and you've also got the watchers, like the old biblical watchers. Services such as education, health, and sovereignty will thus be slowly replaced. That's the whole intention of all this, you see. As was the case with uh, transport, domestic services, and communication by mass-produced machines. This will once again open new markets for businesses and raise the profitability of the economy, since this will mean manipulation of services essential to social order, indeed the foundation stones of states and peoples. It will radically modify relations with the individual or collective imagination, with identity, life, sovereignty, knowledge, power, nation, culture, and geopolitics. Pretty well everything in there. And it says, and now we stand before the next most sweeping revolution awaiting us in the next half century. These watchers will not spring forth ready-made from the imagination of crazed researchers or technicians touched by the hand of God. They will be responding to the financial imperatives of the mercantile order. He's always about the mercantile order. Always in the lookout for new ways to reduce the time needed to produce existing objects, to raise network capabilities, reduce collective expenses, enhance the use of time and transform desires and needs into commercial wealth. Remember, Bernays, again, a member of the same organization, actually, talked about how they, they transform your, your, your desires, unconscious desires, into, and they sell you the products as substitutes for them. This guy's had his, had his ground training in the same organization, you see. Back with more after this break. You're listening to the Republic Broadcasting Network. Because you can handle the truth. Hi folks, I'm Alan Watt. We're back cutting through the matrix, talking about Jack Satali and the futurists and so on, and, and how the world is already planned to take place. And a trick I've noticed over reading a lot of books over a, a long period of time is they'll give you these things like far off in the future, and you because know, it puts you off and thinks I can relax right now. It's not going to happen until 2050, but in, but reality is already starting. You see, and, and and it will be here completely long before 2050. That's a little trick that they use. But it says the the process, they call it the process, the real process, will go through stages, it says, which I shall call hyper-surveillance and self-surveillance. When the law of the market starts to prevail over that of democracies, public services such as education, health care, security, and then justice and sovereignty will begin to face competition from private enterprise. Well, that's already happening, you see. This is a sell off whole sections of government and what government used to take care of to private interests. And they'll begin to face competition from private enterprise governments. Will. States will be, as nation states, will expect to treat chains of foreign hospitals as public hospitals and affiliates of foreign private universities as national universities. 
private security, police and information will compete with national police forces in surveillance of movement and data. That's already happening with all the, as they bring more and more privatized ones into the, the surveillance movement on behalf of government. And it says on behalf of insurance and commercial companies. And that's who's really behind it. These will want to know everything about their employees, clients, suppliers, competitors, and risks. They also want to protect their assets, material, financial, and intellectual against a range of threats. This transfer to the private sector will gradually reduce public spending and help save on scarce resources. Well, they're always on about scarce resources, even though so much of what you're using today is recycled over and over from metal to, to plastic. But it's good for profit, isn't it? Oh, they're scarce. As we've already seen, it will become part and parcel of the host of services, making it possible to track objects and people. Nomadic ubiquity opens itself to... Now, that's also the same as the smart cities, you know, and everything's interfaced with its everything else, all the objects. Nomadic ubiquity opens itself to hyper-surveillance when whoever is connected leaves traces of his passage. Private services will then manage social rights social rights managed by private services and the administrative services. We will be in a position, now he's back to we again, you see, to receive an administrative document or an allotment by paying more. This is already the case with Great Britain. In many places, the state is henceforth relieved of the burden of countless decisions and trusted to high independent authorities that relieve the state of all responsibility. You understand that's taking away all power and all sovereignty as it goes along. You understand that. To private corporations. By the way, just to touch on it too, he also goes into the fact, as I say, that insurance companies will run your whole way of life, by the way. And, and also uh, that if you think you're getting a deal in the States when they bring in uh, privatized, well, not it's supposed to be health care for all, it's under a particular insurance company, they'll start to dictate to you how to live because they want big profit. It's a for profit organization. <laughs> To put it in in different terms, in exchange for a tax cut that will above all all benefit the wealthiest uh, and penalize the poorest, we shall henceforth have to pay for public services. And since these competing private enterprises will have to spend considerable sums to attract clients, which a public service doesn't have to do, the service's final cost for the client will rise accordingly. It's interesting right now, I mean, Britain's National Health Service is now cutting back on everything, even cataracts for the elderly and so on, because you see, they see you as kind of valueless. You you can't pay massive taxes as when you were working, and and they do pay massive taxes in Britain. And so you're just a consumer now, and so you're at the bottom of the heap for for health care. And it's just too bad, so sad, and that's it. And he's agreeing with all of this here, of course. And he says... To put it in different terms, in exchange for a tax cut that will above all benefit the wealthiest and so on. And then he says, users, private individuals or businesses will become consumers. Now you are already a consumer. You don't realize that you're a consumer in, in a, a whole facet of ways, massive facet of ways. Uh, and media, getting back to media itself, has built into it consumerism. It runs on consumerism. They don't give you all the trivia and the rubbish and so on uh, to, to, to entertain you or get you to go, ooh, and ah. They do it to sell advertising. And any business that starts off to oppose it, in fact, to oppose what's happening, ends up in the same boat. They're going after profit, need bigger profit and bigger profit until, until they become the very thing that they were, they were fighting in the first place. Just like, as I say, the music itself, when, it, when it's revolutionary, ends up becoming used by the mass markets, then it's, that revolution's over. You get absorbed into it. And it says, and it can even happen with, with everything that you're fighting, even patriotism. I mean, you end up being the very thing that you think you're, you're, you're fighting, and you'll use more international techniques, technology, and everything else to, to be profitable. And it says here, So you become consumers obliged to pay directly for their services. These insurance companies will demand not only that their clients pay their premiums to insure themselves against sickness, joblessness, death, theft, fire, insecurity, but also verify that their clients conform to normals. You see, I've always talked about new normals. You're given new normals all the time by those at the top. Not, it's not your choice. You think it is, but you're given a, a really uh, new normals to choose from. This or that, and that is bad. It's Pavlovian. Take this, which is right, and that's as bad. You're, tra- you're trained all the time. 
so to new normals to minimize the risks that they will be called on to cover. So insurance companies are there for big profit, right? They will gradually come to dictate uh, planetary normals. What to eat, for instance, and what to know. Ever thought about that? What you're supposed to know? Have you? It's interesting uh, when you go and meet people who work for government, bureaucrats and so on, and all they do is they stand at their little wine parties and, and they like standing, apparently, and um, they chit-chat about books, the latest books that are, that are the best books uh, to, to buy uh, and they're, they're, they're this month's pick of the book club and so on. And that, that's what they do. Someone says, said this, what do you think? Uh, they're always quoting other people, but they have nothing to say for themselves. But they think they know it all because they can quote these other people saying things that they themselves should have come to conclusions in the first place by themselves. <laughs> or how to drive, how to protect oneself, how to consume, how to produce. They will penalize smokers, it's already happening, drinkers, the obese, that's a big push even in the United Nations, World Health Organization has got a big campaign against the obese. And they've even gone so far as to, to allow articles come out calling them fatsos and all the rest of it in the newspapers, just to shame them into slimming. And also the unemployable, the inadequately protected, the aggressive, the careless, the clumsy, the absent-minded, and the spendthrift. In other words, everything that you do is going to be monitored and you're going to get prompted and then told what to do if you, if you don't accept the prompt, you see. This is, by the way, I mean, the computer systems now today are prompting you all the time on what you should be looking at. And here's what others are looking at, you see. Because you see, you don't think as an individual, you, you're, you're more, in, well, if they're all looking at it, it must be good. That's the biggest con in the world. But most folk go along with it, where it's fashion, dress, whatever else. Everybody else is doing it. I must do it too and know that if I, if they ask me a question about it and I don't know, I'll be the odd one out. You understand how you're understood perfectly, perfectly well by the big boys at the top. And it says here, ignorance, exposure to risks, wasting and vulnerability, vulnerability will be considered diseases. Do you understand that? Ignorance. You see, you have to be politically correct and everything yet and you can't say I was ignorant of that. And uh, exposure to risks, wasting and vulnerability will be considered diseases. And remember what I mentioned before, the eugenics boys, and he definitely is part of it too, um, also uh, said that people had poverty genes. You know, that will become more and more into the news. As we think we've found the poverty gene. Uh, they've already come out with lots of things now that they think are genes for this and that and the other. They, they think. That's a good, a good reason to abort you. We think it may. It's possible. <laughs> anyway, other businesses will also have to comply with normals in order to avoid industrial disasters, work accidents or external aggression, and even the wastage of real resources. In a certain way, all businesses will thus be forced to take account of the general interest in making their decisions. Some will even make their citizenship a dimension of their image and their competence. The rise of risks linked to aging, to urban growth, to disasters triggered by ecological disturbances, and to terrorist attacks. We're going to have terrorism from now on forever, you understand. <laughs> Get used to it. This will be forever. It's the greatest technique for pushing all of this through quickly, and surveillance and everything else, and self-monitoring as well. Will gradually raise the share of these insurance premiums in the national revenue at the same time as the share of obligatory tax and social security contributions will go down. Businesses will have at once to respond to the norms exposed, uh, imposed on them by the insurance companies and in their turn require their collaborators, a part of whose contribution they will pay, to comply with other normals. Uh, this compliance will imply monitoring one's health knowledge, vigilance, and property, being thrifty with rare resources, keeping an eye on one's health, training and protecting oneself, and more generally staying in shape, you know, if you're exercising, exercising, will become socially necessary behaviours. For the insurance companies to... See, it's nothing to do with your health boys worrying about you. It has to do with the big boys who profit off you. And they'll make sure they get a bigger profit by keeping you all in shape. For the insurance companies to pay off economically, everyone, uh, private, individual or business, 
must therefore agree that, that a third party verifying this conformity with the normals, for this everyone must agree to be monitored. For this, for the harder thinking, for this everyone must agree to be monitored. The era of, of Big Brother, earlier proclaimed but only partially implemented, will become the norm. And he says, surveillance is master word for the times ahead. First of all, a kind of hyper-surveillance will see the light of today. Technology will make it possible to know everything about the origins of products and movements of men, which will much later imply essential military applications. Sensors and miniature cameras installed in all public and eventually private places in offices and in recreational areas. And finally, on the nomadic objects themselves, will monitor all comings and goings. The phone already allows us to communicate and be tracked, for instance. Biometric techniques such as fingerprints, iris, shape of hands and face will allow for surveillance of travelers, workers and consumers. So you can't do anything without surveillance and going through security checks. As we was telling you, you can do nothing without it. Countless analytical devices will make it possible to monitor the health of a body, a mind, a mind, right, or a product. Getting back to the insurance companies, they want to know all about you. What do you think Facebook and all these other social um, systems are for to to get all the information about you? It's all about that, nothing else. And you thought it was all because they're interested or curious? No, no. First of all, you've got to be predictable in a totalitarian system. But more predictable for those who own you, the big, big boys at the top, money, insurance companies and all the rest of it. Understand, that's where it's all... It's going to come to mandatory insurance for everything. The unique nomadic object will be permanently traceable. All the data it contains, including images of everyone's daily life, will be stored and sold to specialist businesses and to public and private police. uh, uh, Individual data on health and competence will be updated by private databases that allow for predictive tests in view of preventative treatment. Prison, already a heavily financial burden to most uh, nation states, will be gradually replaced by long-distance surveillance of a person under house arrest. It's already here, a lot of people. Nothing will be hidden anymore. That's not true, because he and his own class, you see, even now, are pretty well hidden. You don't find them. You find what they put out on Wikipedia, but you can't find anything else. So it actually passed a law years back to do with very important people, VIPs. See? Discretion, uh, hitherto a condition of social life, will no longer have a reason for being. Everyone will know everything about everybody. Actually, we can't know about the masters, you see. More, it's already here. And we shall evolve in the direction of less guilt and more tolerance. Forgetfulness was yesterday tinged with remorse, but tomorrow transparency will encourage us to do without it. Curiosity is based on a culture of secrecy, and it will also disappear. To the dismay of scandal sheet, celebrity will go the same way. A little later, around 2050, the market will no longer be satisfied with organizing long-distance surveillance. Mass-produced objects will allow everyone to monitor his own compliance with the norm. So everything that you purchase will be monitoring your compliance with the new social norms, norms, all the norms that are given for you. And self-surveillance will appear. Machines will permit everyone, public or private, to monitor his own consumption of energy. Well, that's your smart meter, for instance. That's an example of it's already here. Water, raw materials, and so forth, while other machines will offer self-surveillance of his or her savings and inheritance. These machines will also help save time for living. Already the mirror scales and thermometer, all alcohol tests, pregnancy tests, electrocardiograms and countless sensors are measuring parameters, comparing the test results to the world. Uh, new technology will arise to multiply these portable means of surveillance. Computers will be integrated into clothing by nanofibers, that's already here, and will miniaturize still further the body's self-monitors. Electronic bugs worn subcutaneously under your skin, will ceaselessly register your heartbeat, blood pressure, and cholesterol. Microprocessors connected to various organs will watch their functioning as compared to the norms. Now, you see, you are stock. You're owned. You're owned. You're farmed, technically. And 
you're the first animal that'll be uh, allowed to, to, to monitor itself and say, oh, okay, I've got too much cholesterol, I've got to cut back on that, or the insurance company isn't going to be very happy, I'll get penalised. This is what he's talking about here. This is already planned and, and discussed at the top meetings that Jack Zatelli attends. Miniature cameras, electronic sensors, biomarkers, and nanomotors and nanotubes, which are microscopic um, sensors that can be introduced into the pulmonary alveoli or the bloodstream, will give everyone the opportunity to, to measure permanently or periodically the parameters of his own body. On matters of education and information, We'll also see the appearance of self-surveillance instruments and software for monitoring compliance with the norms related to knowledge. They'll organize verification of the acquaintances. The nomadic ubiquity of information will become the permanent monitor for knowledge. You understand, too, they'll also want to know all your friends and what they're into. And if you start palling around with someone they don't like who isn't following the norms, then uh, you'll get a warning. This is total control, folks. But there's no hype about it or, or yelling. It's just fact. That's all it is. Back with more after this break. Folks, I am Alan Watt. We're cutting through the matrix, talking about the system that's already coming into play. A lot of it's already here in its early phases, and how it's all planned to go. And it is planned to go this way by the, the, well, the masters of the world. But it says, as Jackson Talley says, for a little longer, only doctors and teachers working together on production and testing of these self-surveillance devices will be authorized to use them. Then these objects will be miniaturized, simplified, manufactured at extremely low cost, and made available to all, despite the stern opposition of the experts with whom they'll enter into competition. Surveillance will become nomadic and ubiquitous. It's, it's all pervasive, in other words, you can't get away from it. Everyone will return with passion. Everyone will return with passion to these instruments. Think about it today. They can't, have you seen people sitting, waiting for something, and there's nothing to do? They just sit and stare at their little phone. They stare at it. Nothing's happening, but they stare at it just in case someone phones them or something. Everyone will return with passion to these instruments. Fear of physical deterioration. And what a great con that will be if we were so made into hypochondriacs and, and uh, they've all got to get the latest and so to measure their own bodily functions, see? In case something's wrong, just in case, you know. So, so ignorance, uh, growing familiarity art with nomadic objects, mistrust of the medical and educational guilds, and faith in technological infallibility will open enormous markets for this variegated spectrum of devices. Bent on establishing continual adjustments to their premiums on evaluation of the risks run by each of their clients, insurance companies will urge them to participate in the markets. They will therefore insist their clients furnish proof that they use self-surveillance. That's everything, bodily monitoring, uh, your energy consumption, that's everything. Practitioners will then find themselves a new niche for treating diseases that would not have been detected earlier, while teachers will become tutors to those singled out as refractory in the knowledge field. Now, tutors uh, and teachers are awfully, awfully important right now because they're part of creating the new norms. That's why they're they're paid so much money. They must be prostitutes, basically, and push the new norms. And I've talked to teachers who know what they're pushing, (laughs) especially in the sexual fields to children because they really have to destroy the family unit and all the stuff that would fight this incoming system. And they've done a good job with it so far, anyway. So they, they know, uh, and they've got to get paid an awful lot of money to, to push the next part and the next part and all the technologies, too. Once again, collective services, this time state-run, will become mass-produced industrial products. Everything put in place over the last several decades will meet a triumphant conclusion. Everyone will now have become his own prison guard. Isn't that nice, folks? Because you watch what you say, what you do, and how you act, and you, how you consume, and everything else. And at the same time, individual freedom will have reached the mountain top, at least in the imagination, <laughs> by the use of new nomadic objects. And then I can see that'll happen too. You can go virtually, virtually, you know, almost anywhere. Beyond the self-monitors will come 
and are already coming. Self-repair is making it possible to correct uh, mistakes detected by the self-monitors. One of the early forms of this self-repair will have been the makeup and beauty, fashion, fitness and cosmetic surgery industries. The aging of the world will create greater need for them. It will begin with the integration of self-repair equipment into artificial systems such as machines, bridges, buildings, cars, household equipment and nomadic objects. Then microprocessors first built with organic materials and later from biomaterials will focus on repairing bodies. And if you can't afford it, folks, and you've been bad with the new normals and your premiums go up, well, you can't afford it, well, you'll just die, you see. No one will touch you. Beautiful future. He thinks so. He's one of the guys who helped plan it all. From Hamish and myself from Ontario, Canada, it's good night to me. Your God or your gods go with you. <laughs>